Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. I told you in the beginning of this series that I have always resisted this case. In fact, I swore I would never do it. And from the social media reaction it has gotten, I wasn't totally wrong. Darley definitely brings out the trolls. But she's also brought out some very passionate and thoughtful people. Another reason I have felt conflicted about this case is that Darley feels like a family annihilator to me. But she has never really been classified that way, and I wasn't sure about it. I had never heard about the smothering incident with baby Drake that happened just hours before the murders. Helena, the Routier's housekeeper, told this story in a hearing and the judge ruled it inadmissible for the trial because it was not similar enough to the murders of Devin and Damon. So the jury never knew. But sometimes I wonder if the judge had let the Drake incident in and it was part of the trial record that people obsess over, how would Darley's supporters explain it? They would probably say Helena was lying or mistaken. Would Darley's case still be so controversial? Probably, because she was a beautiful woman, and people have a hard enough time believing a mother could do that to their children. But a beautiful mother? That's even harder to swallow. A woman who seemingly had it all. Motives are often mysterious. Darley is that enigmatic woman I first described. We will never really know. But I will give you my theory. I guess you know by now, I do believe she did it. But you will still get all the facts from me. As Daniel Patrick Mornian wrote, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. Welcome to episode 141, Darley Routier, part three. In the first part of this series, I gave you as much detail as I could about the Routier's personal lives, their financial situation, and Darley's potential mental health issues. They owed 10,000 in back taxes. Their credit cards were maxed. They couldn't afford to fix Darren's car. He hadn't paid his office rent. And most importantly, they were two months behind on their mortgage and about to go into foreclosure. Darren had applied for a $5,000 loan the day before the murders and was denied. These financial issues were minimized at trial. And as far as how much this stress related to Darley, the Routiers said she was upset to be stuck at home with the boys without a car but that was about it. However, she asked her housekeeper Helena to buy her jewelry for $10,000 in the afternoon before the murders. They can try to minimize all they want, but these are the facts of the case. Darley trying to sell her jewelry after Darren was turned down for a loan the day before the murders would have been a factor the jury considered. With Darley's possible postpartum depression, again, the defense and the routiers personally minimized it. Her journal entries can be interpreted different ways, but we can all agree there was a suicide note. Darley did not follow through, but Barbara Joval testified that she at least took the sleeping pills out of the wrappers. She either changed her mind or Darren interrupted. We aren't sure because she changed her story. But this was one month before the murders. I also went through the events of the day before the murders. Darley had gotten a rude phone call from a man who was waiting for a payment for Darren's Jaguar, a sore subject, since his broken down Jag meant she didn't have a vehicle. And Helena, Barbara's mother and housekeeper, testified to the harrowing story about baby Drake. Darley had wrapped him so tightly in blankets in her arms that when Helena finally got the baby from Darley, his lips were blue. Helena unwrapped him, soothed him, and Drake caught his breath as Darley walked off indifferently. Barbara testified that when she came to pick up her mother, Darley was pacing back and forth and everyone was tense. She felt uncomfortable and they left quickly. And then I broke down the 911 call for you, explaining that even that piece of evidence is in dispute. I would rather you go listen for yourselves. I shared the important pieces of the 911 call that were not in dispute. I won't go back and quote all of that again. Suffice it to say, it hurt Darley's case. She was concerned about her fingerprints on the knife. And even if people excuse the 911 call, the responding officers back up her behavior. Because in part two, I walked you step by step through the chaos that the first responders witnessed. Again, to the first responding police officers, 
Darley kept mentioning her fingerprints on the knife and held a towel to her neck, but was never seen trying to help either of her boys, even when Officer Waddell told her to multiple times. And then I took you to the hospital with Darley. This is another part of the story that has always felt really important to me. I've heard so many times that Darley's throat was slashed and she spent days in the ICU. It makes it sound as though she almost died. That is not true. She was taken to surgery because a neck wound is always taken very seriously. But she only needed stitches on the cut that was about three and a half inches long. But it being two millimeters from her carotid artery is a fact. It is a very confusing fact. Either she got lucky or was very careful. Or perhaps someone did it for her. Someone who had training in first aid and might know how to be careful. But reading the testimony of paramedics, doctors, surgeons, and nurses convinced me that not only was the cut on Darley's neck superficial, so was the cut on her arm and shoulder. An ugly part of this case is the people who insist that medical professionals, police officers, detectives, crime scene analysts, and prosecutors all collectively lied to frame Darley Routier. There was a member of my Facebook group who said all the testimony I quoted and cited was just gossip and innuendo. Look, I'm not about to sit here and say there are not dirty cops. My episode on the Norfolk Four was a recent look at that problem. But come on. Like I have said before here and on social media, this case is different. There is much more evidence from too many different agencies. You have to believe that the Rowlett Police, Baylor Hospital employees, the paramedics, crime scene specialists, and even the FBI would lie just to frame Darley Routier. Why would they do that? For that matter, why would other witnesses who are not law enforcement, medical, or legal professionals lie? Most Darley supporters will say she was convicted on the Silly String video. But first of all, the state didn't necessarily repress the other parts of the video. The defense had it, and they chose not to play it. Second, even people who believe Darley is guilty say it's not because of the Silly String incident. We are now a society that is much more educated on forensic evidence. Call it the CSI effect. Call it our obsession with true crime. Either way, we, average citizens, are much more sophisticated about complicated blood evidence. But there is another incident that was not on video, but was admitted in trial, that is almost never talked about. In the Routier front yard, there was an ornate fountain. Community members had been leaving funeral wreaths, flowers, flags, teddy bears, and all kinds of things as a memorial to Devon and Damon. On the morning of Darley's arrest, the Routier's neighbor, Nelda Watts, was about to go to her mailbox when she heard what she thought was laughing, maybe children playing. She lived directly across the street from the Routiers. When she looked out her window, she saw Darley and Darren appearing to play catch with teddy bears and wreaths on the memorial. Quote, Darren would take a stuffed animal off one of the wreaths and toss it over to Darley, and she would jump up and catch it, and then she would toss it back to him, and he would chuck it towards the vehicle. The back end of the vehicle was open, and if he threw it in, she would jump up and cheer. If she didn't catch it, she would pick it up and toss it back to him. Okay, what else did you see? The prosecutor asked. He took the flag off of one of them, and she cheered as he climbed up the water fountain and put it on top of the fountain, and it stayed there for several months, or weeks anyway. She said after this bizarre game, she then saw Darren and Darley dragging the wreaths toward the back, to the trash, she assumed. The defense seemingly tried to grill her, but it was really about her eyesight and memory. Nelda Watts was a retired school teacher. She had taught for 34 years, and she had lived for three years across the street from the Routiers. Later, Darren would try to claim that this was actually him and Darley's sister Dana that morning, which is ridiculous because Dana was 10 years younger and had dark brown hair, not Darley's striking bleach blonde. Besides, Mrs. Watts knew Darley Routier. And they did this in broad daylight, not at night when maybe no one would have seen them. This is just as weird as the Silly String video. Maybe weirder, since that Silly String was supposed to be part of a celebration of life, a birthday party for their murdered son. What the hell was teddy bear basketball supposed to be? As I said, the bizarre teddy bear incident happened on the morning that Darley was arrested. That was on June 18th. The murders were on June 6th. That is 12 days, less than two weeks. 
and obviously something supporters point to, tunnel vision and a rush to judgment. DNA testing does take time, but investigators can and do arrest suspects on circumstantial evidence. I am not going to quote the entire arrest warrant, but I will summarize it for you. It does not contain DNA evidence. First, her suspicious comments on the 911 call, then changing her stories to first responders and then detectives. Darley never attempted to help Damon, though she was instructed to by the first officer on the scene several times. There was a complete lack of evidence of any intruder, no blood in the garage or outside, including the gate. The bloody footprints they found of Darley's did not match her story. Her bare, bloody footprints were only in the kitchen and area leading back to the family room, not leading to the utility room where she said she followed the killer. There was blood in the kitchen sink, which Darley had never mentioned, and evidence that someone tried to clean it up. The warrant also detailed the stab wounds to the boys, the severity of which did not match Darley's wounds, and two medical examiners were cited as saying her wounds were possibly self-inflicted. Then Detective Patterson summarized the warrant and said he found Darley's story to be incredible. So Darley Lynn Routier, then 26 years old, was arrested on this evidence after detectives and crime scene analysts had spent 12 days investigating. For a really famous example, I give you O.J. Simpson. I am actually going to use the Simpson trial a few times as an example. It is a huge case that most people are familiar with, so it helps to put some of the legalities in Darley's case in perspective. So about that rush to arrest, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman were murdered on June 12th. Simpson was arrested on the 17th. That is five days, and I believe we can argue the blood evidence in the Simpson case was even more complicated. They essentially had two crime scenes and his vehicle. And let's now talk about the physical evidence in Darley's case in detail, including DNA results. The murder weapon had no prints. Yes, the butcher knife that Darley kept mentioning to people worrying about her prints being on it had no prints. The handle was not conducive to prints. So Darley basically shot herself in the foot on that one. But it was tested for DNA in four areas. Two areas were Darley's, one was Damon's, and another was a mixture of Darley and Damon's. Darley and supporters have insisted that since Devin's DNA was not found, that is evidence of an intruder with another weapon. But the analyst said it was merely not found in those four spots. Investigators chose four places to test, not the entire knife. That could be for a number of reasons, one of which would be to preserve blood if further DNA testing was needed. This knife has been retested over the years with inconclusive results and it is in the latest DNA testing, and I'll talk about that towards the end of the episode. But one thing should be pointed out. Although we haven't gotten to the sink evidence yet, it is possible that the blood on the knife was washed off after Devin was stabbed. One detail that I had never heard before, but is cited in an appeals document, is that one of Darren's head hairs was found on the knife, which is very interesting. And of course, the murder weapon came from inside the house. Along with a bread knife, investigators believed was used to cut the screen on the garage window, so supposedly the intruder could enter the house. You know, somehow he got a knife from inside and then cut the screen to go back inside. Anyway, this knife contained microscopic residue from the window screen, and this knife had already been tested by the time of the warrant. It is another point of contention. Supporters will say that there was cross-contamination when the knife was fingerprinted. Trace analyst Charles Lynch conducted 10 to 15 test cuts on an identical screen from the Routier's garage and found each time that the fiberglass rods were microscopically identical to those on the bread knife. And here's the thing, even if you don't like trace evidence, the knives were not fingerprinted before Lynch tested them. He received them on the 8th. They were then fingerprinted in the sheriff's lab on the 11th. Neither the murder weapon nor the bread knife were fingerprinted by crime scene technicians. This is supported by the list of items that were fingerprinted at the scene on June 6th. Moving on. The window, where that screen was cut, had undisturbed dust on the sill. There was a mess of storage boxes, a litter box, and a huge animal screen right next to the window. You have to imagine an intruder making his way through there in the dark without disturbing anything. And you have to remember, there was no blood found in the garage, and that's where Darley said the killer ran out. There were also no bloody footprints besides Darley's found. It stands to reason that even if a killer wore gloves and didn't leave any fingerprints, 
his shoes still would have been covered in blood. There was a bloody impression that resembled a knife in the carpet of the family room, approximately 18 inches from Devin's body. The carpeting was removed and sent to the crime lab for further analysis. The significance of this evidence from the prosecution's standpoint was that an assailant would not put the knife down, thereby disarming himself after injuring the mother. The defense pointed out that no carpet fibers were found on the knife, which gives me a great segue to talk about Darley's nightshirt. There were three carpet fibers on Darley's nightshirt and two on Damon's as well, but let's stay with Darley's shirt. Blood spatter expert Tom Bevel found five cast-off or spatter blood stains on the nightshirt. All of the stains contained some of Darley's blood and some of the blood of either Damon or Devin. These stains were not from soaking through or from transfer. There were two stains on each shoulder at the front of her nightshirt. That's four. And then one stain on the back of her nightshirt that was not a mixture. That is the kicker. It was only Devin's blood. And Bevel testified it was likely cast off due to its location on the back right shoulder of her shirt. It was consistent with right-handed Darley raising the knife up, dripping blood on the back of her shirt, then bringing her arm down to stab again. This shirt has been argued over exhaustively. The defense wants to say the boy's blood is on her shirt from her trying to help them. Well, first of all, we have no witnesses who saw Darley help either of her children. Obviously, no one saw what she did or did not do before the first police arrived on the scene, except for Darren. But even if she did, again, these were not soaking or transfer stains. Her blood was probably mixed in because she was injured last, whether she did it herself or not. Either way, the shirt has been submitted for retesting of DNA before, always searching for male DNA other than her son's, and it has never been found. It is also on the current list for retesting from her latest appeal. The carpet fibers found on Darley's nightshirt were close to the cuts in the shirt that matched the murder weapon, and yet she had no corresponding injury there. The cuts were on the right shoulder of the shirt. Remember, she had a superficial cut on her left shoulder, not right. Charles Lynch testified about those holes, quote, It would be my opinion that they were self-inflicted. To cause these defects at the depth of penetration, you need to have tension on the shirt, and it needs to be a short, measured jab. A reasonable supposition is that Darley picked up that knife and made the holes in her own shirt, and then she moved on to Damon. Now let's talk about the blood trail in the house. It showed that Damon did move from where he was originally stabbed by the couch. He wound up face down near the entrance to the stairs. Both Darley and Darren changed their stories about this. Darley has changed hers several times, but most importantly to say that Damon stood up and was talking and followed her and she told him to lie down. Let's put aside the fact that his stab wounds pierced his lungs and he could not have said mommy the way she said he did. And it's unlikely he stood and walked. From the abrasions found on his body, it would seem the child crawled to where he was lying when the paramedics scooped him up and took him to the ambulance. There was a handprint on the couch in Damon's blood that was only visible after luminol was sprayed. Someone had tried to wipe off that print. There was also a handprint of his on the carpet. It hurts to see those in crime scene photos. Darren would later testify that they did move Damon's body, even though he originally said he told Darley not to touch him and that he didn't move Damon because he was afraid of further injuring him. At trial, he said he moved him closer to the wall and pulled his shirt up to look at his injuries. On cross-examination, Darren had to admit he changed his story. Now more on the trail of blood through the house. One of the biggest pieces of evidence in this case that I have not talked about except in the arrest warrant is the blood found in the kitchen sink. There were bloody footprints in front of the sink, blood drops on the floor below, on the edge of the counter, and a swipe of blood on the cabinet door where someone would have opened it. All of that DNA matched Darley. But visually, technicians could not see the blood in the sink until they sprayed the luminol. Trace evidence investigator Charles Lynch later testified that the sink had diluted blood. It had been washed away. But the blood dripped down the front of the sink, on the counter, and on the floor was not diluted. It was Darley's DNA. As for what diluted blood was in the sink, 
This blood was typed as Darley's, with fainter types that could be Devon or Damon. The defense did not even try to challenge the testimony about the diluted blood, especially where it had been cleaned up, which was in the sink and on the faucet. Someone had washed up at that sink, and someone had bled at that sink. The theory of the prosecution is that this is where Darley inflicted her own neck wound. Luminol also revealed two footprints of Darley's that had been wiped up on the kitchen floor. Why? There was blood found on the backsplash of the sink that turned out to be a combination of both Damon and Devon's DNA. This further supports the theory that the knife was cleaned there and then Damon was stabbed again. This will become important when talking about the timeline. But also, of all the blood in the house, it is Damon's that covers everywhere. Devon never moved. He died where he was stabbed. Damon clearly moved himself enough to leave two handprints and may have also been moved by his parents. And then his blood was dripped all over the family room, kitchen, and the utility room. Crime scene analysts believe this blood was dripped from the murder weapon, not from Damon moving. It is a really upsetting visual to have in your head. Someone carrying a knife, dripping with that little boy's blood, walked all over those places. Darley originally denied being anywhere near the sink or cleaning up. Of course, we do know that she changed her story at least seven times. But she added the part about wetting towels after she found out that investigators had cut the kitchen sink out of her house to take it for further testing. Officer David Waddell testified he told Darley four times to get a rag or towel and put it on Damon's back and apply pressure. But she just stood there, holding a towel to her throat. By the time she got to court, she was soaking towels at the kitchen sink to put on the boys. Darren also told this story. He was grilled as hard as Darley and said he had just not remembered it before. They needed to explain why blood looked to be washed away in the sink. And I did say they. Darren's story changed many times too, always evolving to support his wife and fit the evidence. Also, over 40 towels were collected from the Rutier house, and the ones with blood only matched Darley's DNA. Even a dish towel located so close to Devin's body, it can be seen in crime scene photos of his body, only had Darley's blood on it. She did not press wet or dry towels on either of her sons. And now let's move on to the sock. It was found 97 yards from the Routier home. It was in an alley that ran behind the Routier home and was close to a garbage can that was about two doors down. I have checked that number a few times because I always hear that it was 75 yards, but Haley found a map with square footage showing 97. I think the difference is people assuming whoever ran the sock out there did not go in a straight line down the alley, but ran across the grass, making it closer to 75. But let's be really fair and say it was 97, because you could run 75 yards much faster. More on that in a minute. The sock was found by 4.15 that morning. Investigators were not sure if it was evidence because it was the only thing they had found outside of the house, but they thought it looked like it had blood on it, so they bagged and tagged it for testing. Again, this was not in Darley's arrest warrant. After testing, they found there were two spots of blood one with Devon's DNA, and one with Damon's. There was a faint specimen of Darley's DNA, which technicians said could be skin cells or saliva. And there were trace amounts of Darren's DNA, which would be obvious now because he did admit in court that it was his sock. So Darley's defense could never claim it did not come from inside the house. They said the killer had to have dropped it as he fled from the house. I've heard some people say it would be the opposite direction an intruder would have fled according to where the Routier house sat on the corner of a cul-de-sac. Evidently, the entrance to the neighborhood was in the opposite direction. But I think they could argue a killer would have parked behind the house in the alley. Darley said he fled out the garage, presumably through the back and over the gate. One reason this sock is so argued over is the timeline. I've always thought that of all parts of this case, the timeline is overemphasized. Because let's face it, the timeline comes from Darley, from when she called 911. Who says she had to do everything in one certain order? 
First of all, it takes the average woman 30.26 seconds to run 97 yards or 89 meters, according to fitnesshealth.com. Double that time to get back inside the house, and she can do it in just a fraction over a minute. Completely possible. And this doesn't even account for the adrenaline she would have been feeling, which could have let her run faster than an average woman. So let's say both boys were already stabbed, but she had not yet injured herself. It would have only taken her a little over a minute to run that sock out there before coming back inside, inflicting her wounds and calling 911. But the big reason this timeline seems to be set in stone is from trial testimony of a medical examiner who conducted Damon's autopsy. She said it was possible he was alive up to nine minutes. I have always wondered where that came from and was very interested when I read it in the transcripts. It's possible. That is all expert witnesses can say. Probable and possible. What is even more possible, maybe even probable, is that Darley thought Damon was dead, ran the sock out, only to come in and find he was still alive. Then she stabbed him again, now setting up the official timeline if you want to buy into it. And side note, if you're going to insist on the tight timeline, then you need to acknowledge the problem of the motion sensor security light the routiers had. If someone had gone through the backyard, that light was set to stay on for 18 minutes after detection. It was not on when officers arrived on the scene, which was about three minutes into the 911 call. Investigators tried all sorts of ways to get around the light to see if a killer could have escaped the way Darley said and not tripped the motion sensor. But they couldn't do it. So that is a big argument with me with the timeline. If you insist Darley did not have time to plant the sock, are you also going to insist the real killer somehow escaped the motion sensor security light? Because you cannot have it both ways, insisting on this tight timeline, but ignoring the 18-minute security light. And why would she take the sock out there anyway? Even prosecutors couldn't agree. Toby Shook thought it might be deliberate to stage the scene, and so did an FBI profiler who was an expert witness for the prosecution. Lead prosecutor Greg Davis thought she did it because she used it as a glove when she originally stabbed the boys and wanted it not to be found in that alley. Davis's reasoning has merit in that the DNA from Darley was found on the inside toe of the sock. Other physical evidence found in the house is a facial hair and pubic hair and three fingerprints, all unidentified. It is not unusual to find unidentified hair or latent prints at a crime scene. The three unidentified prints in question were all in blood. There were a few prints found that were not in blood. I've seen that number argued over, but it was about 10 prints, and about half of those were found upstairs. It's actually more unusual that they found so few until you remember that the housekeeper Helena had been there that day, dusting, vacuuming, and windexing glass surfaces. Crime scene expert James Cron testified that two of those fingerprints found in blood did not have enough ridges for points of identification. They were found on the door between the utility room and garage. For the record, they were too high up to be from one of the children. The third print is in blood on the coffee table. Cron felt it was the size of a small child. The routiers had Devin and Damon exhumed for fingerprinting, but they were too decomposed to get usable prints for identification. Yes, the medical examiners did fail to print the boys. Mistakes do happen. But we are talking about only one unidentified print. Just think about that. A killer leaves no prints, and the defense is arguing that this one print is the key to the case. That print is smudged in blood, which makes it really difficult to get enough points for identification. So it isn't surprising that it was not matched to Darley, Darren, or anyone else who entered the crime scene other than the boys. This small fingerprint on the coffee table is in the newest round of DNA testing. I am not sure what they hope to find as far as DNA. No male DNA other than the boys has ever been found in the blood evidence. It is highly unlikely they will find it in that one fingerprint. But you know what? They might find Darley's. Cron did say it could be a child or a small woman's finger. I am not going to go step by step through Darley's trial. For one thing, you have already heard a great deal of testimony by the way I have structured this series. I had wanted to tell the story chronologically, but that was pretty much impossible. 
From the very beginning, what we know about Darlie Routier as a mother was from court testimony. I did tell the story chronologically, but I interjected when the fact I was giving came from court testimony, police reports, or official statements. But now let me set the stage for the trial. First, Darlie gets two court-appointed attorneys. The lead was Douglas Parks, who immediately asked for a change of venue, which is standard, but has been heavily criticized because the case was moved to the highly conservative Kerr County. Parks and his co-counsel, Wayne Huff, also hired their own blood experts. Their names were Terry Labor and Bart Epstein. We don't know exactly what they would have testified to, but supporters say it would have been very different from the prosecution's experts. Labor did speak with pro-innocence author Kathy Cruz and basically said further DNA testing was needed, particularly of Darren's blue jeans. Cruz also claimed that they did not testify because Darren and Darley Key rounded up enough money to hire Doug Mulder. Right away, there was an issue because Mulder had actually represented Darren in a dispute on the judge's gag order. He later said it was a minute of his life and irrelevant because Darren did not violate the order. But now, it is a conflict of interest in one of Darley's appeals. And you should know that Darley's original lead attorney, Doug Parks, wrote an affidavit for that appeal in 2003 saying it was a conflict of interest, and he had intended to go after Darren. The affidavit read, quote, A zealous defense of Ms. Routier necessarily involves implicating her husband, Darren Eugene Routier. Parks had planned on entering a pair of Darren's underpants that had blood on the waistline, as well as the fact that one of his head hairs was found on the murder weapon, into evidence. The state filed a motion on November 12th, before the trial in January, to find out if there was a conflict of interest. They would not want a conviction overturned on a pill that could be avoided, and they were right to do so because this issue was denied on a pill in 2003. The judge had offered to hold a hearing, and it was waived by Mulder and Darley. She repeatedly asserted no conflict of interest, and as the Court of Criminal Appeals argued, she had three other trial attorneys representing her as well. And let's face it, at the time, Doug Mulder was a good bet. He was a former prosecutor, and he knew what he was up against. He knew strategy, and one of those strategies was to ask to move the trial back to Dallas County. That motion was denied, and it's fair to say it didn't help Darley's case, but I do believe 12 jurors in a large city could have come to the same conclusion, but there is always a chance. However, it was not a big enough chance to get the trial overturned on appeal. This case is also often criticized because it went to court in six months. But that is the defendant's right to a speedy trial, not the state's. Again, the O.J. Simpson trial is a great comparison. Really complicated blood evidence around the same time, but on a much larger stage. The murders were in June 1994, and opening statements were in January of 1995, almost identical to the timeline of Darley's trial. The Routier children were murdered June 6, 1996, and went to trial on January 6, 1997. I remember reading in Marsha Clark's book on O.J.'s case about how she felt so defeated when she found out the defense would invoke their right to a speedy trial. It is a strategy. It gives the prosecution much less time to prepare. The defense puts on their own experts, but they do not have to map out the forensic case. They just need an expert for rebuttal. The onus is on the state and that's why they call so many different witnesses for different sections of the case. The faster the defense gets to trial, the less time the state has to prepare their witnesses. Okay, so we're off to trial in six months. Something else I've noticed is how Greg Davis does not get enough credit for how he literally told the story of the murders without boring the jurors. Because juries can get bogged down by a lot of technical testimony, so how he structured his witness list really matters. We got a neighbor to set the scene, then the medical examiners to get the autopsies right in the jurors' faces. Then we get the first responding officers, who did not testify favorably for Darley. Then the 911 call, which was problematic. And then the showing of the silly string video. This is brilliant timing. Jurors literally saw the destruction of those little boys, then got to hear and see Darley's behavior for themselves. 
And let's get talk about Darlie's behavior out of the way. Many people feel that her behavior alone should not convict her. Well, first of all, it didn't. The forensic evidence, her changing stories, and most of all, her performance on the stand did. But some are now saying that entering the evidence of her behavior is sexist and it should not have been admissible. Let's hold off on the sexist part for just a minute and just talk about her behavior in general being admissible. For the state to show the video of the silly string incident to the jury, it was admitted as evidence. Judge Mark Toll ruled it admissible. And for the record, Darley's attorneys have never raised the silly string video in her appeals. I know how many of you in my group have stated passionately that you do not believe the silly string incident should show cause for guilt or even have been admitted. But it is admissible because it goes to her state of mind. This was a week after her children were murdered. You are still allowed to believe that her behavior at the graveside should not be judged because people grieve differently. The jury was also welcome to judge the graveside behavior as not important. Do you think the defense didn't raise that issue at trial? They did, with her psychiatrist, Dr. Lisa Clayton, who, like many of you, testified that people grieve in all sorts of ways. The jury got to hear that rebuttal, too. But also, the silly string video goes to character. You can rightly argue that the prosecution's whole case was about Darley's character. Well, her motive anyway, which they did not have to legally prove. The rest of the case was forensics. But we need motive in the same way we need closure. And we get it about as often. The prosecution was not going in there with no explanation. And so what do you think the defense's case was? That Darley was a loving mother who would never murder her children and that there was no motive or confession in the case. That is a character defense. Quote, You will understand that this lady is an American mother, just like any other number of American mothers. It was up to the jury to decide if Darley's character was that of a normal American mother. And let's look at their witness list. Out of the 16 defense witnesses, 11 were friends and family of Darley's. That leaves only five other witnesses for expert testimony. In contrast, the prosecution had over 50 witnesses. The first two days of the defense's case and their first seven witnesses were all character witnesses for Darley, people who said she was a loving and attentive mother who would never murder her children. But as the prosecutor in Jeffrey McDonald's case famously said, if we can prove that he did it, then we don't have to prove that he's the kind of guy who could do it. Okay, let's get back to the trial summary. After the 911 call and silly string video, the state put on all the Baylor medical staff. I detailed their testimony in the last episode. Everyone from her surgeon to nurses said Darley's wounds were superficial, and they all said she behaved strangely. I know we don't necessarily like the behavior opinions, but this is what medical staff do all the time. It's how they formed an opinion that she had a flat effect, and they had never seen other mothers who lost their children act the way she did. And why would they risk their reputations, their jobs, hell, contempt of court, all to conspire to frame Darley Routier? They wouldn't. Haley pointed out in her notes that whenever witnesses testified, Mulder and Davis in turn argued that they had been coached. That is a very popular argument for unfavorable testimony, and Mulder went further, saying they had met in the hotel before trial. The Baylor staff did meet with prosecutors. Obviously, this is called preparing a witness. The defense does it too. It does not mean they were coached by the state or that they could be coached by the state. Supporters complain they testified to things differently than what was in Darley's chart. Well, they are not allowed to put their opinion in charts. They can only put observations patient appeared tearful, things like that. In trial, they were asked their opinions and they gave them. What is interesting is the motion for mistrial right after their testimony. These motions are not uncommon throughout with a good defense attorney. But what is notable is that the motion was made because the staff all talked about that hideous bruise photographed on Darley's arm when she came back to the police station on the 10th, four days after the murders. I talked about this bruising extensively in the last episode. 
every single medical professional who cared for Darley at Baylor denied that bruise had been there. They didn't just deny it. It was not in her charts. Her doctor said he would have ordered x-rays. I could go on and on, but I know I will never change some minds on this. But I will say it was not from an IV infiltrating. That also would have been noticed before she was discharged. And no, all of these medical professionals did not just miss that extensive of a bruise. Family members claimed that they saw the bruise in the hospital, but this was after all the Baylor testimony. And remember, Darren's aunt was taking notes the entire trial. She was not on the witness list, so she was allowed in the courtroom. No one in Darley's family had mentioned that bruise until after the prosecution admitted the photos as evidence and questioned the Baylor staff. That is not an accident, but I can't wait to talk about it more at the end. Back to the trial. The responding paramedics rounded up the medical testimony. We already discussed what they observed that night. Just like the responding officers, they never saw any towels on Devin or Damon. And they never heard Darley ask about her sons, not even the ones who rode in the ambulance with her. And please remember, none of the towels recovered from the crime scene had Damon or Devin's blood on them. Only Darley's. Next, we get to a criminalist officer named David Maine who testified about the boys' insurance policies. This was another big fight, and one you don't hear all of. Supporters say that police rifled through drawers and found these policies. Crime scene techs photographed the policies in a stack of papers on a sewing box, which lay two feet from Devin's body. I guess they staged this photo before they even knew who investigators believed killed those children. And it wasn't just insurance. It was their birth certificates, social security cards, and other identifying papers. And also, a handwritten last will and testament from Darley. Maybe she did intend to kill herself. And next, we come to James Cron, the crime scene specialist called in by the Rowlett Department, who knew they needed more expertise. I went over his analysis in the last episode. He felt that the totality of the evidence, as he often calls it, showed that not only were the boys murdered by someone in the home, but that someone was Darley Routier. After Cron, we have blood spatter expert Tom Bevel. I discussed his testimony earlier in this episode as it related to the evidence found on Darley's shirt. I didn't get into all of the blood spatter analysis of the home, mainly because I do know some people think it's junk science. I don't. It makes a lot of sense. For instance, blood spatter on the wall near where Damon was found showed that someone who was bleeding had stabbed him. The spatter on the wall matched Damon's DNA, and then the drops of blood on the floor underneath it matched Darley's. Again, this evidence is very tedious, but you can see literal blood maps of the Routier home if you Google images for this case. And that is very grim when you start matching little boys to their DNA on the walls and the floor. The biggest problem people have with blood spatter testimony is why didn't the defense call their own expert? If you recall, I told you the original court-appointed attorneys hired two experts, but Mulder decided not to use them. He told author Kathy Cruz, quote, I didn't think they had anything. I didn't think they brought anything to the party. He does sound flippant, but it could be that he was afraid of what would happen to them on cross-examination. Cruz also said that experts Terry Labor and Bart Epstein were still owed money and that Mulder kept it for himself, which is quite an accusation. Mulder supposedly also said the men were resentful that Parks and Huff had been replaced. Terry Labor talked to Kathy Cruz for her book, and if she asked him about being resentful, she didn't include it in the final print. What we do know is that the blood evidence has been brought up on appeal plenty of times. Darley's appeals attorneys have said she didn't have fair access to DNA and other forensic testing. It's not true. Charles Lynch met with Labor and Epstein numerous times, all the way from mid-June up to New Year's Eve of 1996, right before the trial started. Lynch also said he let them test Darley's nightshirt before he did because he wasn't that far along in his testing yet. Tom Bevel also met with Labor and Epstein in December of 1996. So you tell me, why were they not called just weeks and even days later? Is this more of the trial being rushed, or could this be strategy? 
Maybe Mulder saw how testing was going and decided not to risk using his own experts. After the prosecution rested, the defense put up their parade of character witnesses. Like I said, 11 out of 16 witnesses were character witnesses for Darlene. Her expert medical examiner tried his best to show that Darlie's wounds were not self-inflicted, but just like other experts, he is bound by the same rules, and on cross-examination, he had to admit that the wounds were possibly self-inflicted. On cross, he admitted that the surgeon who stitched Darlie up would probably know better if the wound was self-inflicted. He also explained that he can only say probable and that anything is possible. Often, it is a game of which expert witness you choose to believe. But in this case, the jury did not only get two battling medical examiners. They also got to hear from Darley's ER doctor, the surgeon, and other medical professionals who all believed her wounds were self-inflicted and that the extensive bruising had to have been self-inflicted after she was discharged from the hospital. Also, the FBI profiler for the prosecution, Alan Brantley, testified about the bruise, quote, Because of the nature and symmetry, it certainly didn't look like anything that was coincidental to a struggle or being grabbed. It looked like either the arm had been beaten on something or something had been beaten onto her. But let me go back and tell you about more of the profiler's testimony, because it was extremely powerful. He was the last witness for the prosecution. He said the boys were killed by someone they knew well. He agreed with James Cron that the crime scene was staged. There was no indication of an intruder, nor was the physical evidence consistent with a struggle. Whoever killed the children were careful not to do much damage to the home, despite what was staged. You have to remember and realize that we are basically talking about one broken wine glass and a coffee table that was set on its side. Brantley went into great detail about the scene, every bit of furniture or decor that was untouched. His best quote about this is, What stands out, what is a stark contrast, is you have a maximum human devastation and loss here, but an absolute minimum of breakage or property damage. Someone that breaks into a home to burglarize it, and especially someone who breaks in to kill people, would not have been so careful. They would have been smashing anything in their way. He also went into great detail about the lack of evidence of an intruder, but also that the children were the focus of the crime, that it was personal. He also pointed out that Darley was not targeted for sexual assault, and if she had been, the boys would not have been murdered first. In those types of cases, the threat of violence against the children is used as a way to control the victim. He testified that robbery was obviously ruled out because Darley's jewelry was in sight. So that means there was no motive of robbery or sexual assault. The only other motives are personal. Okay, now let's get into Darley's defense. I told you that they basically called all character witnesses. We did have one medical examiner who did not hold up well on cross-examination. And they called Detective Jimmy Patterson, mainly to impeach him. He was not called by the state, probably because they did not need to call him. Not because of the cemetery recording, which I am getting to. The state had a multitude of expert witnesses who were not just what we call professional witnesses. These were law enforcement and medical personnel who worked directly with the Routier crime scene and personally with Darley Routier. So they did not need a detective to take them through the case. And since the experts in this case were so difficult to impeach, the defense called the original detective. Patterson had handed over much of the investigation to people and departments who had more experience with this type of crime. All the defense could do was badger him about his personal notebook and ask why he could not remember what was in each and every report submitted, even if it wasn't submitted by him. The defense was flailing with the detective, until they did bring up the recording at the graveside. Doug Mulder said, quote, You folks put microphones at the graveside to monitor the conversations of the people who had gone there to pray and to mourn and grieve at the passing of these two children. Yes, sir, the detective answered without hesitation. Now, most of us know that police do this. I don't think anyone who follows true crime would be shocked. Police are hoping someone will come out and unburden their soul and confess. But immediately, 
Mulder began accusing Patterson of violating the federal wiretapping law. Actually, he kept saying violating federal law or committing a federal felony. The judge interjected and said Patterson would know state law and might want time to read the federal statute. Mulder agreed to move on, but kept trying to find a way to bring it back up. It was actually artful. He did do a good job. He got it on record that Patterson wanted to seek advice from counsel before answering about the cemetery recording. You should know that the detectives had gotten permission from the cemetery owner. And after Darley's trial, they won in federal court when it was ruled that the routiers did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a public outdoor cemetery. But since Mulder kept dramatically accusing him of breaking a law, Patterson was careful. When he was recalled later, he pled the fifth. He only pled the fifth on the part about the cemetery recording. If Mulder had started with that part of his testimony, he would have had Patterson pleading the fifth for the whole trial. Because that is what happened to his partner, Detective Chris Frosch. This all gets jumbled up when people discuss this case. They say dramatically that the detectives on her case pled the fifth and that alone should have been a mistrial. They don't offer any context that it was only in reference to the cemetery audio and that they were later found innocent of any wrongdoing. And maybe that's why Mulder made the mistake of not showing the video or playing the audio that the state had given him. There was video of the prayer service. The news channel just chose to only play the birthday part. But the defense did have this evidence, and they chose not to play it. So the jurors did not see Darley crying and praying before they saw her laughing and spraying silly string. Mulder has often said that if he had known the silly string incident was going to be such a big deal, he would have played the other part of the video. It is often said that the state played the silly string video repeatedly, like seven times. No, the jurors asked for the video and played it themselves repeatedly. There is a big difference when you say that. But this is often what happens when other people don't really do their research or they are trying to gloss over the facts to make Darley sound more sympathetic. So now let's get to Darley. She testified on her own behalf against advice of counsel. I have often seen Mulder criticized for this. He should not have let her testify, they say. Well, he could not stop her. She has a right to testify, just like she has the right to not testify in order to avoid incriminating herself. Darley chose to testify. I think she thought she could tell her story and be believable. What she probably didn't consider is that this jury had just sat through extremely graphic testimony about the murder of her children and would not really want to hear the happy story of her life. She also did not consider what might happen to her on cross-examination. Because for her direct testimony, that's what she did. Tell her life story from birth to her happy marriage, right up to the murders, including her journal entries, so that she was able to explain, minimize, and even say she was embarrassed by her journals. And then she gave her most elaborate account of the night of the murders yet. She artfully included testimony that explained bad evidence against her, like running back and forth wetting towels. I cannot quote her entire testimony. It's too much. But I encourage you to go read it if you want to. The important part is the cross-examination. Darley repeatedly said she didn't remember parts of that night. And when challenged or questioned, she either said, I don't know, or I don't remember. She gave those two responses 72 times on cross-examination. At one point, the state decides to impeach her with her own letters. She had written so many letters while in jail leading up to the trial. And in many of them, she said things like, I know exactly what happened that night. Or, I know exactly who did this. I was there. I saw his face. She had actually accused two men of being the killers in letters, and yet failed to bring up these men to investigators. When her letters were brought out, she seemed incredulous and said, where did you get these? And then she says, oh, from the jail. Isn't that illegal? Reportedly, people broke out in laughter at this, including a couple of jurors, until the judge banged the gavel for order. What was not funny was how many times she was asked 
how could you sleep through your children being stabbed? And she said, I don't know. Assistant DA Toby Shook eviscerated Darley on the stand with questions like these. He went through her testimony point by point, poking holes and asking why. By the end, Darley was dissolving into tears. I think Darley thought she could get on that stand and charm the jury. No matter how much her attorney would have tried to warn her, she thought she could make it through cross-examination that way too. It didn't work. After the trial, the prosecution made the old joke that Darley was their best witness. And Darren didn't really fare any better. His version of events completely backed up his wife's adding in the details to account for physical evidence now saying he watched his wife running back and forth wetting towels. He was impeached with his earlier official statement to police and pretrial testimony at Darley's bond hearing. Like Darley, when confronted with discrepancies, he says, I don't know or I don't remember, and he said these things 67 times. And Darren's big mouth got him in a lot of trouble. For instance, he told a witness that he and Darley were planning on book deals and that Darley was going to write the book herself to cut out the middleman and go for the big figures. Darren had gone to his old house snooping around the windows on December 3rd, one month before the trial. When the new owner, Corinne Wells, came out and asked what he was doing, he said he wanted to see if any of the screens had been cut. The prosecution asked if it was to, quote, come up with some feasible story to tell the jury as to how the window screen got cut on June 6th. Darren said, I was just very interested. Meaning, Darren knew the knife to cut the screen came from the house. He went to his old house looking for cuts to, I suppose, testify and claim he had done this himself in the past and why. This should tell you how important the evidence of the bread knife was. Whoever used that knife brought it back in the house, and put it back on the knife block, probably thinking it could never be tied to that screen. But then it was. Darren was desperately looking for a way to explain it. Even though he and Darley had always denied knowing the screen was cut or that they had cut it themselves. So many things about this case reek of desperation. It's interesting that the book deal comes up again, too. In a pretrial hearing, he was asked about a book deal with Paramount Entertainment. He denied it. But the jury got to find out through Corinne Wells. After the trial, it came out in the press that he, Darley, and Mama Darley had all signed with an agent. After being questioned about Corinne Wells, Darren was asked about statements he made to a CPS worker, Jamie Johnson. He told the Child Protective Services worker that Darley had been very disappointed that Drake wasn't a girl. He also said that the boys were getting in the way of his and Darley's relationship. Quote, there was no time for me and mommy to be sexy or run around the house naked. Darren denied saying this. But why would Johnson have put this in her notes? Why would she lie? It's safer to say that Darren Rutier suffers from diarrhea of the mouth. He can't seem to help himself. The questioning about the social worker got into things he said about Darley's appearance. Like before Drake, she was a size 4, and now she was a size 8. Darren flat out called Jamie Johnson a liar. The prosecution took this testimony about Darley's appearance and then asked Darren about his wife's breast implants, that the Routiers had spent $5,000 on these implants. He got Darren to say that Darley's appearance was very important to both of them. This is some of the testimony cited when people say this trial was sexist. The medical examiner who inspected Darley's wounds, Dr. Janice Parchman Townsend, was asked if she knew Darley had implants. The prosecutor's point was that none of Darley's wounds were near her breasts, unlike her sons, whose grave wounds were in their trunks or chests, as the doctors put it. The prosecution was not only trying to nail down the message that Darley Routier was a vain woman, but also point out that Darren was just as concerned with her appearance. Again, this goes to character. The picture they have been painting all along of Darley Routier is that she was a vain materialistic woman. And the implication about her breast implants is that neither she nor her husband would have faked wounds in that area. This is also a hint that Darren may have helped Darley cover up the murders. I think it's a big stretch to say this whole trial was sexist, 
but I can see how people worry over the breast implant questions. But I can also see the prosecution's point in asking these questions. I don't think Darlie Routier deserves a new trial for these questions or for the attack on her character. Her whole defense is that she was a normal American mother who loved her children. That is a character defense. None of what the prosecution said or did was anything other than refuting that idea. Head Prosecutor Greg Davis ended Darren's time on the stand with a very effective questioning speech about a killer who got really lucky. Like a killer, quote, lucky enough that while he was attacking both your children, your wife doesn't wake up, right? Darren says, yes, sir. And then lucky enough that when he leaves out the garage to your backyard, that he either scales that fence without leaving a mark, or he opens the gate, and then he latches and closes it without anybody detecting that either, right? Yes, sir. A real lucky guy, wasn't he? Then Darren Routier answers, yeah, and I want him dead. Greg Davis shot back, so do I, and then said, no further questions. When Darlie's psychiatrist testified, she talked about two different studies on mothers who kill their children. In one, there are five categories, battering mothers, retaliating mothers, mentally ill mothers, unwanted children, and mercy killings. In the other study, there are six, altruistic murderers, acutely psychotic murderers, unwanted child murderers, accidental murderers, spouse revenge murderers, and neonaticide, which is murder of a baby within the first 24 hours of life. Dr. Clayton testified explicitly that Darley did not fit into any of these categories. I agree that Darley is difficult to categorize, at least on face value. But if you dig deeper, Darley fits one of those categories in each study, retaliating mothers and spouse revenge murderers. A few people who declined to testify for or against Darley did talk to authors after her conviction. Even some who did testify had held out. Like neighbor Karen Neal, she told author Barbara Davis a story about overhearing Darren screaming at Darley, calling her a fat pig, and saying if she didn't lose the weight, he would find someone new. She said she walked into the room and said, well, hello, Darren, and he walked off embarrassed. Other friends and family say Darley and Darren were fighting and screaming at each other constantly in the months and weeks leading up to the murders. Another family member told Davis that at Darley Key's house, after the funerals, Darley stepped up and announced that she and Darren would take a trip to Europe soon to get her scar removed and were planning on conceiving a baby girl. Relatives were shocked. The boys had just been buried but the routiers seemed to be planning the next little Darley. But still, family mostly towed the line when it came to trial. But not after. When several family members went on record with authors saying Darley was emotionally abusive to her children, constantly cursing at them, and never wanted them around. But we have to remember, the jury found her guilty on the forensic evidence and her own poor trial testimony not these statements made about her after the trial. And of course, Darren didn't help her case either. Darlie Routier was convicted on February 1st, 1997. The 25th anniversary of her death sentence was actually the day before this recording, February 4th. Obviously, wrongful convictions happen. I have covered them. It is often a case of mistaken identity, as with Jennifer Thompson and Ron Cotton in episode 83. And more upsetting are the racially motivated wrongful convictions, like Clarence Bradley in episode 64 and Walter McMillan in episode 85. But this is not what happened with Darlie Routier. Some have said that politically, the Rowlett Police Department needed to close this case quickly. When that point is brought up, I have often wondered... What if the police had pulled in a lineup of men with Darley's general description, and she picked one out? Would this case have its own Helena Stokely, so to speak? The Routier and McDonald cases are eerily similar in many ways. I'm glad that no innocent man was drugged through the ringer in Darley's case, like what happened to Stokely in McDonald's, even though Darley did try to pin it on two men in her jailhouse letters. Darley's supporters always say that her quote in the 911 call about touching the knife was in response to a question from the operator. Not exactly. The operator told her not to touch the knife, 
and Darley said she already had. One minute and 20 seconds later, she brings it up on her own, quote, his knife was lying over there and I already picked it up. And God, I bet we could have gotten the prints, maybe. But this wasn't the only time. She also told the story about the knife and her worry about her fingerprints many times in the hospital to doctors and nurses. Some asked her what happened, but for most, it was just Darley constantly bringing it up on her own. This reminds me of Jeffrey McDonald telling the ER doctor, quote, tell the MPs and CID that I pulled the knife from my wife's chest and threw it on the floor. But I digress. It's easy to go into rabbit holes in this case. It took weeks of research. When Haley turned in her research to me, it was more than 50,000 words, and it was the most hours she has ever billed me for. It took me about a week to really go through all of Haley's reporting and then read the trial transcripts and appeals myself. And I had already spent over a week watching documentaries, reading articles, listening to podcasts about Darley's innocence, and I chose one book that focused on her innocence to read. Because I did feel that she was guilty, and she had been convicted. So while Haley gathered the official reports and testimony that convicted Darley, I looked at the other side. Where there's smoke, there's fire, right? The book I chose is called Dateline Purgatory by a Texas reporter named Kathy Cruz. I had vetted a bunch of books on Darley's innocence, and I chose this one because it was endorsed by people I very much admire. Michael Morton, whose case of actual innocence I covered in episode 110, Mike Cochran, another famous Texas author who wrote the quintessential book on Priscilla and Cullen Davis, and Jeff Blackburn, the founder and chief counsel of the Innocence Project of Texas. After reading Ms. Cruz's book, I feel like these blurbs are similar to how I see Stephen King exclaiming every latest horror novel on the charts gave him chills and kept him up all night. Except, and I hate to say it, but I'm not entirely surprised by the Innocence Project guy. I will point out he is a founder and not the current director who declined to take up Darley's case. But I will never forgive Barry Sheck for his lies and performance in the O.J. Simpson trial. If Sheck, co-founder of the original National Innocence Project, could be bought, it does make me question their involvement in other cases, especially Darley's. Besides Sheck selling out, they are wrong about 42% of the time when it comes to DNA exonerations. That number is from their own website. And as an example, they were also involved in the Wanda McCoy case I covered in episode 121. They stood behind Keith Coleman up through his execution. DNA later proved he did rape and murder his sister-in-law. And the Innocence Project helped put that monster on the cover of Time magazine. My point is, they certainly do not always get it right. I obviously know they do a lot of good. But we also have to be critical thinkers and look at their real statistics. They are now involved in the Darley Routier case, with two lawyers helping to get new DNA testing. The sock, Darley's nightgown, and the bloody fingerprint that was unidentifiable will be tested. Other items have been added to the list. I saw an article that said the Innocence Project is paying to ship the entire garage window for testing. For what it's worth, Barry Sheck and the Innocence Project have also lobbied for Jeffrey McDonald. The DNA testing proved that Jeffrey McDonald's hair was found clutched in his dead wife's hand, under his daughter's fingernail, and in many other places it shouldn't have been if he wanted to prove his innocence. Also, for what it's worth, Barry Sheck declined the Darley Routier case. Maybe he learned his lesson with O.J. He was very highly criticized for his participation in the trial especially since he carried such a prestigious weight and that he was rarely challenged in the media during the trial, unlike other key experts. And this is not the first time Darley's team has had evidence retested. She has, on appeals, been granted testing in 2008, 2014, and 2018 on most of the same items. The results have always been the same. The DNA is from Darley and her sons, or it is inconclusive due to it being too small of a sample or the sample being too degraded. And I have to tell you, pro Darley groups will lie about DNA results. I kept finding this screenshot, but not the actual document, and it was saying Darren Routier was ruled out on a limb hair. Her supporters kept saying it was a limb hair from the sock. That is a lie. Haley finally found the entire document, and it was just hairs from the crime scene, not the sock. Thank God for Haley. 
I go down rabbit holes and she pulls me out of them or helps me prove them. We texted constantly about this case all through our research and especially during my writing. I'm not sure why the Innocence Project has chosen to get involved in Darley's case. So far, they have not made many public statements about it, but they did send the attorneys to help get new testing. An ABC documentary from 2018 is the only thing listed about her on their website. But come on, let's be honest. There is a lot of public pressure, and donations make up 55% of the Innocent Project's funding. Taking on a case like this could help their cause. And I promise you, I am very glad they are involved. Hopefully, they can help finally put this case to rest. Either way, because if Darley is innocent, I want her out of prison as much as her supporters do. But I honestly do not hold much hope that these tests will come back any differently. And maybe this will finally shut down her post-conviction DNA testing for good. In early appeals, she was often denied testing because her attorneys claimed the evidence wasn't available to her which, as I told you, was untrue and why her early appeals were denied. And she's on her last leg, at least with appeals to get a retrial. She was on her third that is allowed by the state of Texas when the Innocence Project stepped in with a motion for yet more DNA testing. Most people who believe pro Darley websites and articles do not realize that the authors are cherry-picking facts. They are not reading the actual transcripts for themselves. For instance, They harp on the silly string incident as being prejudicial, but they always leave out the teddy bear incident. And do you know why people don't read the full transcripts? Because unlike what you see on TV, trials can be very dull. For instance, I read a whole section about hair and trace evidence collected upstairs in the Routier home. I knew good and well, as did investigators, that if there was an intruder, he didn't go upstairs. But I still read it for due diligence. But the thing is, When you do take the time to read the transcripts, that's when you find the really persuasive parts of this trial, or even just really interesting details. Like, I noticed that a witness said Darren knew how long it would take for Darley to run that sock out to where it was found. Now, before I read this, that sock business had long gotten on my nerves. Quote, you told Corinne that if Darley wanted to take that sock and put it down the alley, it would take her only 27 seconds to do that didn't you? Darren said, no, sir, I didn't say that. You already heard why Darren was questioned about Corinne Wells. He seemed to be trying to find a way to testify about cutting his own screen windows. And then he got into a big discussion with Ms. Wells, where he made that statement about the sock. This is one of many statements she said he made that he denied. He also called her a liar. I had first asked my husband, who played football, how long it would take someone, not even a woman, to run 75 to 100 yards. He said about 30 seconds. Not that I didn't believe Mr. Kelly, but I texted Haley and asked her to find me a source, which she did. Even Haley, who practically went blind reading these transcripts, had missed that sentence from Darren, even though she pointed out the Corinne Wells testimony for me in her research. Then, I saw on the website DarleyRoutierFactAndFiction.com that the author, Barbara Davis, whose book I did not read, had conducted her own test. I didn't read her book because, first of all, she changed her position. And second of all, I told you before that I wanted to read pro-innocence books anyway. She originally felt Darley was guilty. Barbara Davis performed her own test at the crime scene. She said she ran it in 50 seconds, and she pointed out that she was 20 years older than Darley at the time. And about Barbara Davis. She is often mentioned with this case and was brought up in Kathy Cruz's book. Davis claims she changed her position once an anonymous source sent her those photos of the extensive bruising on Darley's arm. She claimed the jury did not see them. Are you kidding me? then why did so many nurses and doctors have to testify about not seeing that bruising in the hospital? You know, the testimony that caused Mulder to ask for a mistrial? There was one juror who has said he regretted his vote. Charlie Samford claimed he had never seen the photo of that large bruise. In the transcripts, Assistant DA Toby Shook instructed a bailiff to show the photo to each juror individually. There is no way the jury did not know about the bruising or for that matter, author Barbara Davis. She actually attended Darley's trial. Her position is so ridiculous, I considered not including it, 
but I felt I had to because she has made a lot of noise. And as many people have pointed out, by suddenly changing her position on Darley's guilt, she got on the talk show circuit and her book sales went up. She and author Kathy Cruz appeared on a CNN documentary in 2015 repeating misinformation. Cruz repeated a lie that after errors were found in the trial transcripts, Darley was offered a life sentence if she would confess, and she refused to take it. This is categorically untrue. Prosecutor Toby Shook released a statement denying it, but it's a stupid rumor that won't go away. The court reporter in Darley's case was brought up on contempt charges after failing to get the record submitted in time, and then she lost her license when some 30,000 errors were found. Some people believe that alone should have won Darley a new trial. But three accredited court reporters reviewed the originals and then a new reporter recertified the transcripts by using audio tapes of the trial. It was brought up on appeal, and the court found that despite these issues, after the new transcripts were gone over, they found that Darley received a fair trial. Kathy Cruz, who had gone on that CNN documentary, had written in her own book, Dateline Purgatory, that Darley was offered that life sentence if she would confess. Again, the prosecution has categorically denied Ms. Cruz's accusation, to the point that Toby Shook had to make that public statement. The DA's office points to the court's decision on the 2004 appeal about the transcripts, basically saying, why would we offer her a deal after this? And speaking of interviews, let me tell you something. Before I dug into the reading, I watched every interview I could of Darlie Routier. And now I can confess she had me going. I can see how people are swayed, even charmed by her. I found her compelling, articulate, and sympathetic. You know who bothered me in interviews? Darren Routier. I found him to be smug, inappropriate, and frankly, he looks like a liar. Right from the beginning, next to Darley, he is smiling inappropriately. I think the truth is that Darren is not a good liar. That pro-innocence book by Kathy Cruz on Darley was revealing to me in a lot of ways about Darren. But one was in a way that I had already suspected. He is really gross about women. It's not just on the official record. It's not just what he said about Darley's breasts on the Lisa Gibbons show. Brian Pardo, the millionaire who took up Darley's cause, told a super creepy story to author Kathy Cruz. He said Darren somehow got past his state-of-the-art alarm system to knock on his front door. He let him in and even invited him to stay for dinner. And during their talk, in which he characterized Darren as trying to maybe control the narrative, Pardo found many things to be odd. One was that Darren brought his own gun and showed it off. Pardo insisted this seemed more like bragging than an attempt to intimidate him. But do you know when Pardo finally showed Darren Routier to the door? When he made a comment about his wife's breasts? Pardo spent $100,000 on his independent investigation, and they found that Darren Routier was likely the main suspect. And when Darren failed a polygraph, he stopped cooperating with Pardo. Okay, so let's talk about Darren. I think he lied a lot. And five years after Darley was convicted, he signed an affidavit saying he discussed setting up a fake burglary for an insurance scam. But he denies ever following through and has even said he thought it was very doubtful that someone misunderstood and then broke into his home and attacked his family. I mean, he could, if he wanted to, leave that question out there. Say, sure, I think that's what happened. But he didn't. In fact, these days, he is divorced from Darley and has said he will not risk his own life for hers now. He still insists that she did not kill their children, but he is not willing to trade places with her. He divorced Darley in 2011. But as much as we might want to raise the specter of Darren as the murderer, we can't. He was the prosecution's original prime suspect until the physical and blood evidence pointed to Darley. Remember, Darren had an actual financial motive to kill Darley her $200,000 life insurance policy. But the police looked beyond that. And it's not just the forensics. It is Darley's story of that night. She repeatedly said Darren was not the murderer. In years since, defense attorney Doug Mulder said he could not say Darren was the intruder at trial when Darley insisted he was not. Also, if Darren did this, the police would absolutely have arrested him. They would have known it would be harder to convict pretty young Darley Routier 
men are much more likely to commit violent crimes. His hair was on the murder weapon that was his tube sock, but it is Darley's blood dripping all over in places it shouldn't be. It is Darley's story of that night that we are given. I think it's fair to say Darren helped her cover up the murders. He came down and saw what she did. Some say maybe he is the one who carefully cut her neck. It would explain that head hair of his found on the knife. He was trained in first aid. He would know where the carotid artery is. People often say that Darley could not have cut her own throat, that there is no way she could do that with her non-dominant left hand. Well, if she was trying to make it look like an intruder, yes, she absolutely could have switched hands. If I was faking injuries, I would switch hands. And there are two hesitation marks in that cut. And some say she did not have the intellect to have planned these murders, if they were planned. Maybe not. People also say the boy's life insurance was not a motive. I'm not sure that is true either. Her house was about to go into foreclosure. $10,000 would have solved that problem. Remember, that is the exact amount she tried to sell her jewelry for to the housekeeper the afternoon before the murders. And people say that life insurance wouldn't even cover the boy's funerals. But I'm not sure that would have been on her mind when she was only thinking of saving her house. Desperation. That is the driving factor in this case, whether the desperation is financial or the implosion of her marriage. And what would make Darren lie for his wife? Guilt? Did he believe he drove her to this? I can see him calming her down and then saying, okay, we need a story. That also helps solve the timeline issue. Darren could have easily ran that sock outside as Darley called 911. He isn't heard until 43 seconds into the call. Call 911. I'll run the sock out. The jurors who were interviewed after the verdict said they went into deliberation wanting to find something to show her innocence, but they just couldn't find it. And that brings me back to my original gut feeling about Darley Routier. She is a family annihilator. I think it's possible Darren caught her in the middle of it, or she called him down to show him what she did. I think they did have a terrible fight that night. After the trial, Darley admitted that she had asked him for a divorce that night, and Darren did not deny it. In fact, he told author Kathy Cruz that Darley often threatened divorce to push his buttons. This night would have been one of the most stressful in their marriage. They were broke. They were about to lose their house. They had been screaming at each other for weeks. Then Darley got that nasty call about Darren's jag. That could have been a trigger for this big fight. Maybe this time when she threatened divorce, Darren said fine, and that's why she was sleeping on the couch. It wasn't about the baby waking her up. They were angry at each other. Darley sat on that couch, furious at Darren, furious at the state of her life, and let's not forget Finrage. She was on those dangerous diet pills that have been taken off the market. She lies there, thinking about all their problems. Maybe she is thinking about how she could hurt Darren like he was hurting her. Her innocent sons lying on the floor near her were not a comfort. They only made her angrier. They made her life more difficult. She was stuck at home with him while Darren got to be out doing whatever he wanted. I don't think she planned to kill her children. I think she did it in a fit of rage. Maybe she screamed for him to come down after she had cut her throat. Of all the types of filicide, the revenge motive makes the most sense. Look what you made me do. Devin and Damon Routier are very lost in the circus that is the Darley Routier case. I tried to humanize them every chance I got to remind you that when I talked about DNA or blood droppings, that it was the blood of these two little boys. They are not just a blood map in an infamous murder case. They were little boys, five and seven years old, whose final moments were filled with horrific pain and confusion. The defensive wounds on their bodies, the abrasions on their legs. They saw who was stabbing them. Damon Routier even crawled for a little while. It doesn't get much more horrific than that. 
Do you understand the savagery it takes to stab a little boy? And these were deep stab wounds, going all the way through, breaking rib bones. That is the biggest reason people have a hard time believing Darley could do this, that a mother could do this. But if we are honest with ourselves, we know mothers do this all the time. No, not typically with knives, but it does happen, and they also shoot their children. It is not always the drownings we think of in the media. There was no sexual aspect to this crime, not to Darley or the boys. Serial killers of boys typically kidnap them first. They do not break into random homes just to stab them. We could talk more about postpartum psychosis. It is a possibility, and one that the prosecution seemed to want to leave open by entering Darley's journal and suicide note. But mothers who kill due to any mental illness, including postpartum psychosis, almost always confess. It's been 25 years, and Darley Routier has not budged, and I don't believe she ever will. No, this crime was personal. She was enraged. This was revenge. The spouse revenge category that I spoke of is about parents who kill their children to deliberately make their spouses suffer. It is one of the oldest reasons we know to kill. In the ancient Greek play Medea by Euripides, after killing their two sons, Medea told her unfaithful husband Jason, Thy sons are dead and gone. That will stab thy heart. Look at what you made me do. Southern Fried True Crime is written, hosted, and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched by the one and only Haley Gray, with additional research by me. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. I am sorry this series took so long. I agonize over details, and I wanted to give you as much detail as I could. I wanted to tell you the things I read that I did not hear on any other documentary or podcast. And I wanted to debunk many of the myths of pro-innocence books and especially websites or other biased sources. I wanted to give you examples of rabbit holes that even I fell for. At 14,000 words, this is the longest script I have ever recorded. And there was no way I was going to do a part four. This case has taken a great toll. I am so glad to put Darley Root here behind me. If you have any case suggestions, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com, and go to the listener suggestion tab. And don't forget to come join our Facebook group, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group, where we swap recipes, worship Dolly Parton, and share memes. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit asses allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, and Spotify. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.